Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Welcome, I'm Derek, and I'll be leading us through our service today. Whether you're new to our community, this online experience, or if you've worshipped with us many times before, I want you to know we're really glad you're here. We want to encourage you to worship together with others. So we have community groups meeting together virtually as we worship today. If you're not in a group, we also have a public group you can join. Our hosts will share a link in the chat. As we worship together today, there will be words in bold on the screen that we invite you to say along with us. And we recognize it can feel weird to speak or sing in our rooms on our own, but I want to invite you to push through the awkwardness as we worship together with word and song. Let's prepare our hearts to worship together. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. Let's worship together. you have 
Let's our King be glorified. Jesus, how majestic is your name. Thank you for being our king and the ruler that we need. Thank you for loving us, and we pray that you would help us walk with you uh, and share you as the light of this world. In Christ's name, amen. As we continue to worship, we'll do so through confession. 
Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. I invite you to take a physical posture that reflects a posture of humility in your heart. You might sit or kneel. So together, let's open our hearts before God, turn away from our sin, and turn to Christ. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take comfort in these words from the Apostle Paul. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So knowing that Jesus lifts us up out of our sin, receive these words of assurance. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the gospel is good news of great joy. Let's rejoice together. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. He has defeated the powers of death. Alleluia. Jesus turns our sorrow into dancing. Alleluia. He has the words of eternal life. Alleluia. Our scripture reading today is John 8, 12 through 30. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him, because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he says, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let me add my welcome. My name's Alistair. I'm the lead pastor of St. Peter's Fireside, and I'm excited to welcome Taya Anthony as our guest preacher today. You might recognize her from serving on our hospitality team or co-leading a community group. Taya has been a member of our community over the past two and a half years. 
She's an elementary school teacher, and we're really excited to welcome her as our preacher today. So after the service today, if you have her contact information, please encourage her and let her know how the Lord spoke to you through her, because I know that can be of great encouragement to someone when they're preaching for the first time in a new place. So please uh, welcome Taya. Hi, as Alistair said, my name is Taya, and I'm really excited to be here with you today. So before we begin, let's pray. Father God, I thank you for being with us here today. Thank you that you are able to see us, you are able to know us, and that you are going before us. And I ask that as we look into this passage, that um, the light of Jesus would shine through, that your Holy Spirit would be uh, speaking to our hearts, and that you would help us to walk forward into your light. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at our passage today, we jump into the middle of a conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious leaders at the time. One of their main roles was to study and to teach the law. And as the crowds listening to Jesus grew larger and larger, the Pharisees started watching very closely. It wasn't long before the Pharisees started questioning some of the things that Jesus was saying. So before we get to our scripture reading, let's look at this exchange that happens between Jesus and the Pharisees. As Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, the Pharisees brought a woman to him. This woman had committed adultery, and the Pharisees uh, were there with Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 4, we read, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? The Pharisees' goal was to try and get Jesus to go against the law. They were looking for grounds on which to arrest him. Now Jesus takes a moment to answer, and he bends down. He writes in the ground with his finger. I'm so curious to know what he wrote in the ground. Maybe it was his signature that he was practicing, like I practiced my signature when I was getting my first checkbook and kept writing, Taya, Taya. But I think Jesus is probably writing something else. We can't be sure because he doesn't mention it in this passage, but we do know that when Jesus stands up, he looks at the Pharisees and he says in John chapter 8, verse 7, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. With that answer, they stop questioning him and disperse. Only Jesus and the woman are left there, and he asks her if anyone has condemned her. No, she replies. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, go and sin no more. It is after this exchange that Jesus speaks to the people uh, and he says in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Imagine for a minute if Jesus wasn't in that previous scene. The ending would have been pretty different. In the version without Jesus, the stones were probably thrown instead of left on the ground. Without Jesus, this woman was in darkness, and there was no way out. But Jesus was there. Now, some of you know that I'm a teacher. I'm teaching grade four and five this year, and things look a lot different now than they did a couple months ago. Um, yeah, back in the fall, though, when we were able to go on field trips, uh, we went to the Britannia Mining Museum. And we were studying natural resources and the rock cycle at the time, so it made sense to take the students to an old mine. A hundred years ago, this facility was the largest copper mine in all of the Commonwealth countries. It's now open for tours to the public, school groups, even a few movies have filmed here. Part of our tour was to travel by train car through the mine, and we went to look at one of the sites where they had found one of the deposits. As we stood there in the mine, looking at the drill, our guide told us she was gonna turn off the lights. There was electric lighting that ran down the edge of the tunnel. 
and she said that we should first hold our hand out in front of our faces, and she was going to count to three and then turn off the lights. On three, everything went dark. I tried to squint to see my hand that was just a few inches from my face, but I couldn't make it out. It was literally pitch black. This was one of the few times I've experienced that kind of darkness. The darkness that doesn't seem like it's going to go away. I looked down the tunnel and I couldn't even see the light that was coming from outside, even though it was the middle of the day. I can't imagine having to try and find my way out of that tunnel, out of the mine like that. And I can't even imagine trying to choose which direction to go or take a couple of steps forward. Without a light in complete darkness like that, it's impossible to find your way out. Right now, we're in the middle of a series. We're looking at how Jesus identifies himself in the Gospel of John. We saw how Jesus is the resurrection and the life, as well as the bread of life. And now we turn to Jesus' statement in John chapter 8, verse 12, where he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It seems like a simple statement. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Simple, right? But when we start to think about what that really means, we find it's more challenging than what it appears to be. So what is this claim that Jesus is making? And if we do believe that it's true, what does that mean for us? These are the main questions we're going to explore today, and we'll do this by looking at three things. The light, the darkness, and the journey. The main idea that I hope we can come to recognize in all of this is that just as light is a guide in the darkness, Jesus promises to be our guide as we journey through life's dark places. So let's start by looking at the light. Light is such a rich metaphor. Because of this, it's easy to start thinking about all the examples in our life that have to do with light. When I first looked at this passage, I know I was tempted to write down all the comparisons I could think of. Like light is growth, light is warmth. And although some of these might be interesting to explore at one point, I think it's important to look at the context we're in. Where does Jesus say this? And who does he say it to? A bit before the passage we read today, at the beginning of John chapter 7, we read, The Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. The Feast of Tabernacles was a festival celebrated every year in the Jewish calendar. The festival reminded people that God led the Israelites through the wilderness. This was after God had freed them from slavery in Egypt. God led the Israelites through the wilderness to the land that he had promised them. Partway through this feast, Jesus began to teach in the temple courts. And while he was there, he declared, I am the light of the world. So right after a very dark moment with a few Jewish leaders about to pick up some stones, we turn to a national festival about light. Now, a key moment in this feast was something called the illumination of the temple. Four 75-foot high lampstands would be lit within the temple courts. Picture the courts. There was a wall around the entire thing. The first court you would enter was the court of women. The four lampstands were lit within this court, and it was said that the light from the lampstands reflected off of all the temple walls. Since the temple was built on the top of a hill, it gave light to the entire city. At night, the city would have otherwise been in darkness. Let's think a little bit more about the significance of these lampstands. Remember that the feast recalled the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness. If we look back in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, we read, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. When Jesus said, I am the light of the world, his hearers could see these lampstands. They knew the story of the Israelites. They had thought about the pillar of fire at night leading them, and they could see the light coming from the temple, lighting up the city at night. To them, light was a guide and a promise of God's presence. It was hope in the darkness. 
So it's clear to see that light is a guide in the darkness. It's also a symbol of God's presence. And God himself is the light that guides us. But when we see the light and the path that it illuminates, the backdrop is still darkness. Let's turn to our second point, the darkness. Jesus says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This statement, as we saw before, it's full of hope, but we have to explore the alternative in order to fully grasp what Jesus is saying in his promise. Let's compare this statement to the statement Jesus makes about being the bread of life. We looked at this last week. Jesus makes a reference not to a physical reality, but to a spiritual one. When he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, he's referring not to the darkness of night, but rather to the darkness that is in the world and the darkness that's in us. We know the darkness in the world all too well, from acts of violence in a quiet community carried out by one man in Nova Scotia this past week, to the world hunger crisis, to the realities of COVID-19 that pervade all aspects of our lives right now. There is darkness around us, and we know that darkness. But sometimes it's harder to see the darkness that's within ourselves. We often think that darkness is out there, not in here. We want to keep the darkness at a distance, and we especially don't want to think about our own darkness. The writer G.K. Chesterton was once asked by the Times of London, what's wrong with the world today? He replied, dear sir, I am. May we have the confidence, like Chesterton, to recognize that the darkness out there starts in here. Can you see that? I know I've felt this recently. Maybe some of you have too. With COVID-19, we're in a season where much of our life is spent in one spot. With less people around us, there's the potential to spend more time with our own thoughts. Because I live alone, I have no one to distract me from that darkness. And I have seen this darkness show up more frequently than I would like. It's unsettling being in darkness. Imagine being stuck in an unknown place. It's unfamiliar, all the lights go out. You can't see. What feelings do you start to experience? You might feel anxiety, fear, you might start to panic. As we begin to examine the places of darkness within ourselves, we experience a variety of feelings. For me, the darkness brings out feelings of loneliness, disappointment, sorrow. These feelings lead me to seek out coping strategies. I reach for what I think will make the feelings go away. Sometimes these coping strategies are okay. Sometimes they're not. In my effort to alleviate these feelings, I start to search in the darkness. I try to look for something that will make it better. I try to bring some light in. But that good feeling that might come just lasts for a second, and then it dissipates. I'm left in the darkness. It's like lighting a match and holding it out in front of you and just watching it burn. Quickly, it'll go out. You can't do much against the darkness with light like that. I know my unhealthy coping strategies well. They're not new. Spending more time alone has just given me more time to realize what they are. It's hard to come face to face with this kind of darkness. Now that you may have more space with your own thoughts, ask yourself, where do my feelings lead me? Where might I be stuck in the darkness? To be clear, the feelings of loneliness and disappointment and sorrow are all valid. And I continue to remind myself of that. I do not need to be ashamed of my feelings. It's okay to feel lonely. It's okay to have negative, negative feelings. In Lent, we saw that lament is part of our yearly church rhythm. And the feelings that come when we experience darkness around us should not be ignored. A few weeks ago, I was talking with my mentor, who also happens to be a counselor, which is a wonderful thing. And she suggested to try and find the root of that feeling. 
That way I can begin to figure out what I'm really looking for when I reach for those unhealthy coping strategies. It starts with bringing these things into the light. That's the hardest but most necessary part, to bring these things before the light of the world, before Jesus, and allow him to illuminate my darkness. The dark can be uncomfortable. Just think of all the children you know who are afraid of it. I know I was as a child. It's the same when we face our own darkness. We try and find our way out around in the dark, and then when a light's turned on, it's blinding. You can't see. Our eyes can't handle it. And at first, it might even be harder to find our way around. When the light illuminates our darkness, it can hurt. But that initial sting is part of the process. Let's look back at our passage now and see the ways that light interacts with the darkness. For the woman, the darkness within her is pointed out right away. She is a woman caught in adultery. Her sin is evident to everyone. But when Jesus speaks to the Pharisees, he reveals their own darkness. When they question Jesus about the woman, Jesus says, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. None of the Pharisees venture to pick up a stone. We read, But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. The Pharisees recognize their own sinfulness and realize they can't condemn this woman. It's interesting how John mentions that the older ones leave first. They don't need as much time to realize that they do have darkness in their lives. Maybe that's you. Maybe you can see the darkness really quickly in your life. Or maybe you can't see it at all. After Jesus declares he's the light of the world, he says to the Pharisees, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. The Pharisees recognize some darkness within themselves. Yes, but they can't see the full extent of the darkness that they're in. And sometimes the darkness actually seems like a better place to be. It's a place we're used to. We know we can find things that make us feel a little bit better in the darkness, even if it's just for a split second. I know for myself, I feel like sometimes the light's too hard to face and staying in the darkness seems like the better option. So I just choose to stay there. Do you see this happen in your life? Is there a part of you that wants to stay in that darkness? Well, the Gospel of John confirms this stark reality. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Sometimes we'd rather remain in the dark because it's the dark we know. Now let's turn to our last point, the journey. To quote American theologian J. Ramsey Michaels, Jesus himself is the light of the world, but not a fixed or a stationary light source like a lampstand or a city, or even like the sun. Rather, he is on the move, for his implied invitation is to follow, and his promise is to not walk in darkness. From this, we can recognize two things. One, we're invited to journey out of the darkness, and two, the light shines as our invitation. We saw how God was a light for the Israelites in the wilderness, and we saw how the Pharisees were walking in the darkness. Hopefully we can also start to recognize the ways that we ourselves walk in that darkness. Jesus promises that he will be the light for whoever follows him. And it's Jesus, the light, who gives us an invitation out of that darkness. He invites us to follow him. But this act of following requires steps because it's the start of a journey. Jesus came as the light to invite the world to step out of the darkness. Jesus says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
When Jesus speaks to the woman caught in adultery, he does not condemn her, but rather he calls her into action. He calls her to go. Go, Jesus tells her, and from now on, sin no more. Jesus invites this woman on a journey, a journey to leave the darkness she's in. Jesus sees the sin in her life, and yet he still invites her. Of course, it's not possible for this woman to get rid of all the darkness in her life entirely, but that's why it's a journey, and Jesus promises to be her light. Jesus' light is for the whole world. He offers this journey to the Pharisees as well, but they don't quite see the invitation. The Pharisees continue to question Jesus about who he is, they can't comprehend that Jesus' testimony or promise is true, and so they walk, or rather stumble, in darkness. The Pharisees don't join Jesus on this journey, and Jesus warns them. I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. The Pharisees are stuck in the darkness. At times, I know I have felt like I've been stuck in that darkness. I can't find my way out, and my flimsy little match keeps going out. Darkness. The darkness we see in ourself is hard to face. It's uncomfortable. It's hard to talk about. Maybe your darkness is lying all the time, or comparison that leads to intense jealousy. Maybe your darkness is an eating disorder or pornography. You might feel you're stuck in the dark. You might have tried to find the light and the darkness keeps overwhelming you. Or maybe it feels to be more comfortable in the dark. You are afraid of what might happen when you do step into the light. If this is you, I hope that the words from Psalm 139 would encourage you. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. This passage can tell us two things. One, even though you might not be able to see in the darkness, God sees you. Whether you want him to or not, God knows you and he knows your darkness. Two, whether you're ashamed or maybe even proud of your darkness, God is not shocked by it. So if God already sees you and all of your darkness, why not let his light in? We know that we cannot completely leave sin or the darkness behind. It will continue to be the backdrop of our lives. But Jesus promises in John chapter 12, verse 46, I have come into the world as light, so whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If we choose to begin this journey with Jesus, or we're already on this journey with him, we will not remain in darkness. Yes, sin will be part of the backdrop of our lives, but we'll have the light, the light who on the cross faced the darkness for us all. Jesus stepped into our darkness. He knows it. He faced it, and he's calling us out of it. Because of this, we're not going to be confronted with a scenario like I was in, in the mine, where I couldn't see any light around me. I had no way out. But we have hope that as Jesus' light leads us, it will become brighter and brighter. And one day, we will no longer see the darkness. One day, the darkness shall be no more. This is God's promise, the promise that Jesus proclaimed to the world. In Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 and 20, we read, The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. We read about this as well in the book of Revelation. 
When I was teaching grade one at a Christian school, I used to read the Jesus Storybook Bible all the time. And as I was preparing for this sermon, I remember this particular passage. I think it's a beautiful way to paraphrase the promise in Revelation chapter 22. Where is the sun? Where is the moon? They aren't needed anymore. God is all the light people need. No more darkness, no more night. And the king says, look, God and his children are together again. No more running away or hiding, no more crying or being lonely or afraid, no more being sick or dying, because all those things are gone. Yes, they're gone forever. Everything sad has come untrue. And see, I have wiped away every tear from every eye. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is Jesus' promise, to give himself to the world as the light of life. That though we experience darkness in this life, if we continue on this journey with him, there will come a day when all we see is light. Jesus is that light, the one who will illuminate everything forever. As we look at the backdrop of darkness in our world and in our lives, we take comfort in Jesus being our light. And it begins as soon as we take our first step on this journey with him. Just as light is a guide in the darkness, Jesus promises to be our guide as we journey through life's dark places. Wherever you are on this journey, I pray that the hope of Jesus' light allows you to take a few steps closer to your Heavenly Father and that you find a deep, deep sense of joy as you hold on to the light of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being here with us. We thank you for sending Jesus into the world as our light. We pray that as we feel like we're stuck in dark places in our lives and in our world, that you would come into those places. We pray that we would be able to journey with Jesus as our light, going before us and guiding us. Thank you for loving us and seeing us, no matter where we're at in the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue in worship, let's cry out together to the Lord and ask him to intercede in our world and in our lives. After each prayer, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll reply, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Father, we pray for Nova Scotia. Words can't capture the gravity of this tragedy. We pray for the 22 lives lost and the community impacted and with our nation, we grieve. Lord, we don't know where you are in this tragedy, but we cry out and ask for you to show up, to comfort, and to bring the justice that only you can bring, to somehow make things right, and to somehow bring healing out of this grievous act. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the Asian community throughout Metro Vancouver. Uh, we're grieved that there's been an increase of hate-related crimes. Uh, we grieve for the 92-year-old man who was attacked um, and as slurs were yelled at him about COVID-19. Lord, we're grieved by this kind of evil in our own city, but we also acknowledge that it comes out of deep brokenness of the human soul. We need you, Lord, to intervene, to create compassion, to heal us all, that we might be understanding and not divide the world into us and them, but to be united under you. So Lord, please have mercy and please fight back against the racism 
that is rising up at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for our world, for our nation, and for our neighbors, especially in the United States. Please intervene in this COVID-19 pandemic. Please heal those who've caught this disease, especially those who are at great risk of losing their lives. Please intervene. Please grant wisdom to doctors and researchers who are working tirelessly for a vaccination. We pray for the Oxford trial um, that is now testing on human subjects. And Lord, we pray for our healthcare workers who are working tirelessly to care. Lord, we need your help. We need your intervention. We need you to show up. And as we look at our world and we feel the pain that is so deep, we pray, come Lord Jesus. Please return. Please make things right. Please make things whole. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now, as our Savior has taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. As we wrap up our service, I have a couple of announcements that I want to get on your mind calendars. The first is our all parish meeting. It'll be next Sunday, May 3rd. And this is a meeting for anyone who calls St. Pete's home or anyone who wants to learn more about what we're all about. At this all parish meeting, we're gonna talk about our response to COVID-19, uh, different ways that we've collaborated with the government and other churches, how we're pursuing love and how we're seeking to be creative. We're also gonna give a more detailed financial update and some of the actions that we're taking in response to this season. At this meeting, we're also gonna present some new uh, candidates to join our leadership team and you'll have an opportunity to vote for them. And we're gonna make some time for a question and response because we know you likely have many questions about what's happening in the life of our community, especially as we're learning how to be a community together in this virtual world. And so if you can, please register online at stpf.ca slash events. The meeting will be at 1 p.m and you need to register to get the Zoom link. So please register right away and we'll gather next week for worship in the morning and then we'll have our meeting in the afternoon and we'll also have our broadcast at 5 p.m. I also wanna let you know about 101. It'll be at 1 p.m. after our 10 a.m. broadcast. And this is a great opportunity for anyone who wants to learn more about St. Peter's. We'll cover our story, our history, our vision, and our values, our core theology, We'll also talk about different ways you can take steps to get involved in the life of our community. So if you'd like to join us for 101, it begins at 1 p.m. and you can get the Zoom link by visiting stpf.ca slash events, or it'll also be available in the chat window. As we wrap up our time together, I wanna to invite you to consider how you can steward your whole life. Everything we have from God is a gift and he invites us to give our whole selves to him. And one of the things he invites of us is the stewardship of our financial resources. If you're able to give at this time, we invite you to give. But if you're not able to give, that's okay. Especially if you're just exploring our community, we want you to know that no one asked you here for your money. We're really glad you're taking part in what we're doing during this time. 
But if you can give, you know why we give. We believe God is at work and that he invites us to use our temporary and finite resources to participate in his eternal and everlasting kingdom. As our service comes to a close, I want to invite you to continue to pray and to continue the conversation. If you're meeting virtually with your community group, stick around for another 10 and 15 minutes uh, in your Zoom call and pray together and discuss how the sermon impacted you. If you're not in a group, you can join our open group. The link will be posted in the chat window and there you'll be able to meet other people, uh, share your prayer requests and discuss the sermon. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Now may God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you that his way would be known throughout the earth and his saving power throughout every nation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although we are social distancing, we are a sent people. So go with God's peace to love and serve those you interact with. The service is ended. Amen.
very many people are going to see it, but I think that's really funny. Let me know. So yeah, go ahead. I just run all the way, do it all the way to the end. There we go. <laughs> all these at-home workouts. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh, you're yeah, still in I'm frame, going. yeah. <laughs> nice. All right, all done. <laughs>